This episode is sponsored today by the book, 10 Tips on How to Survive Your Parents' Divorce. This book was written by kids. It's for kids. It's a coloring book. When you have a tragedy of divorce and you have young children who do not know how to express themselves, this coloring book, 10 Tips on How to Survive Your Parents' Divorce, is the coloring book for them. Pick it up today at blendingthefamily.com or even on Amazon. 10 Tips on How to Survive Your Parents' Divorce, again, written by kids for kids. Welcome to Blending the Family, the podcast. Topics can range from dads hitting rock bottom, daughters watching their parents' divorce, or even what is a good wine for couples to have while talking about finances. Here's your host, whose Facebook likes are actually a negative number, Tommy Maloney. Check, 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 break, check. Check, one, two, check. Whoa, oh my gosh, almost dropped the laptop. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Blending Family. I'm your host, Tommy Maloney, coming from you, coming from you, coming to you from the backyard, from the patio. And you will hear actual live birds. No, this isn't where uh, the birds are pumped in, piped in on some type of golf show. Wink, wink. I wanted to do this from outside because it's just so nice out and I decided to take a walk earlier and came up with an idea walking while podcasting so there you go we're going to have uh, a two part series on that I don't know when I'll put that out maybe this weekend but let's talk about our guest on this episode of Blending the Family the podcast the founder of Turning Point Parenting Santia Benevente God, I hope I didn't screw up Santia's name, either first or last, but oh my gosh, we had a blast, we had a blast. I actually heard her on another podcast of one of my mentors, uh, Stephen James uh, Peterson, on his podcast, and so I was kidding with her because her and Stephen had just a wonderful exchange, but... They were using words way over my head, and so I told Santia, I go, yeah, I do maybe dollar words, not $30 words that her and Steven were uh, using, um, but let's, let me put that on pause right now. So like I said, I'm, I'm doing this from outside. I'm sure the neighbors are probably going, and that we have new neighbors too, so they're probably going, uh-oh, one of them weirdos, huh, one of them weirdos. One of them hippie podcasting people. Yes, say that ten times fast. But woke up this morning and all of a sudden my back started stiffening up. And I laid back down to just reset it. And uh, we were planning on doing uh, pulled pork sandwiches tonight. And I just realized I forgot to get buns. Crud. Hmm. I'll have to figure out something. But anyway... I decided I'm going to go for a walk, try and walk out this back pain, which was really helpful. And I haven't been proactive as far as exercise and health goes. Uh, I reached out a while back to one of my other mentors, uh, Marcus Really Sanderson, and one of the first questions he asked me was, how is your health? And then I said, it's crappy. So I figured today it's supposed to be uh, close to 90, I believe, here in northern Colorado. And I'm like, well, I got to go to the grocery store. I have to get some barbecue sauce for the pulled pork. I've never done, I've, I've never done pulled pork. Uh, Anne has, my wife has set it up, but this is the first time I've thrown in the barbecue sauce and a few other ingredients, including, including, this is an exclusive, I did use, uh, we had one left, a bottle of, beer that was infused with chili i'm like i I really can't do spices but i was like what the heck let's try it see what happens so i threw that bottle in on the i i picked up sweet baby ray's hawaiian uh barbecue sauce so i've got all these different flavors i'm really excited about this so I'll, i'll let you know how it goes uh, so yeah, so I, I took the the phone with me, took my headset with me, and as I was walking, I, I looked like a, a moron, like I do probably right now if somebody was watching me. 
from the from their backyard going what is he doing so yeah i just walked and talked and did a part one once i got to the grocery store and then part two after i left the grocery store because i really didn't want to walk around the grocery store looking more strange than i normally do that's exciting the other thing too is i want to either remind you or just let you know if this is the first time you're listening to this podcast thank you Thank you for tuning in. I know I have some new listeners, even some friends. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Scott M., Scott M., who I've coached with in the world of hockey, and I talk about that on the um, the Walking Well podcast. And I mentioned Scott. And um, so, if you're a new listener, thank you so much. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for leaving ratings and reviews. Super excited, but a couple of announcements. Number one, yes, I have a piece of paper in my hand. That's what that sound is, other than the birds. But the newsletter is back. I spent my past weekend huddled, and this is probably why my back is so jacked up, because I've been sitting so much. And you know what the new saying is? Smoking is a new sitting. Or sitting is a new smoking? Oh, God. Something like that. And like I said, I just... Uh, hunkered down in the office last weekend working on the website, making some changes to that, uh, learning how to use WordPress better, learning. Oh, my gosh. Duke, you've been eating grass again. Ugh. I really wish he'd stop eating grass and start eating his food. Hold on. Yeah, this is going to be disgusting. Come here. Come here. you got grass. I'll hang out of your mouth. There you go. Want to say hi to listeners? All right. The newsletter is back, so please, please go to blendingthefamily.com. Well, I'm sorry, I don't want the I don't want the laptop to fall. So please go to blendingthefamily.com and sign up for the newsletter, and I will be happy to send it to you. No, you're not going in yet. I'm recording. You need to go lay down, okay? Also. New coaching opportunities. If you need coaching, I am here for you. I, I set up two, uh, just two packages. I didn't want to get overwhelming of people, so I developed two easy little packages. One is like a, a, a one-time, one-day type thing. The other one, I put together a 12-week uh, process for you. So we have the newsletter new coaching uh, packages. Uh, what else is going on? Still working on the uh, the weekly column with the Good Men Project. I think we're getting ready to, this will be week six by the time this podcast launches. Six? I can't keep track. If you're not familiar with the, the column that's going on right now, uh, it's called God Pushed Me. And I talk about the leap of faith of... Um, Quitting one job, getting ready to take on another job, and that job ended up falling, <laughs> falling apart. Didn't happen, and so I'm I'm putting my faith in God right now that um, things are going to change, things are going to happen um, for 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 the family in a good way, um, not just financially. And I will say yes, I really would like the financial piece to really fall into place. <laughs> But I, I feel there's other things that uh, God has intentions for me as long as I, again, put my faith in him, put, you know, put my hands in him, if that makes sense. So, so there you go, Good Men Project. Just type in, go to Good Men Project, just type in my name, Tommy Maloney. You'll find several uh, of my articles, including uh, rebroadcasts of this podcast as well. So there we have it. Uh, newsletter, coaching, Good Men Project. Duke's hanging out right here. Poor guy. Uh, just I just came back from inside from doing some yard work out front. And I'm trying to think, was there anything else? I think that's about it. Yeah. So that's it. We're, let's talk about Santia. Oh, my gosh. He had a... Um, she was just a phenomenal guest. Phenomenal. I, I see, I see her coming back, and I see her starting on her own podcast as well. I really do, and I should, I should recommend that too. I'll send her a Facebook IM. 
All right, I'm trying to look at all the notes. One of the first things we talk about on this podcast is uh, her her first name, and I'll give you a hint: that's not her given name. And I'm super excited that she was um, so willing to open up and tell us uh, about how her first name actually came about. Last name, that's still uh, her real last name. I believe that's her married name. Um, But, yeah, Uh, we talk about how uh, she came about working with the Jai Institute. So that's the Jai Institute for Parenting. Um, And, again, I'm looking at my notes Oh my gosh, we talked about so many things, so many things. Um, you know, I, I might as well just quit. Uh, oh, that's what it was. Uh, one of the things you'll hear on this episode, and you might hear this in past episodes, where experts such as uh, Santia in the uh, parenting coaching space like to do if I say something and and I'm very much open-minded about this and let them um (laughs) I guess psychoanalyze me or just analyze me so uh we have a little fun with that on the virtual couch uh talk about how her daughter learned how to find her voice and we're not talking like the singing type voice we're talking about maybe talking back to mom type thing and i do pose the the famous question that you hear on this podcast a lot and that is if the kids don't get along do you continue dating and she had a very interesting perspective and a little different perspective in her situation so we go into that all right that's about it. That's uh, that's all I want to bore you with right now. I just want you to get into uh, listening to this episode with Santia. And again, Santia's uh, Benevente, her um, website is turningpointparenting.com, turningpointparenting.com. Uh, thank you to Stephen James Peterson for having her on your podcast. And um, yeah, again, those two used what I call $30 words. And again, I'm only a $1 word person. Enjoy this episode of the podcast. And thank you for continuing sharing the podcast, downloading, uh, telling your friends, your family, your tribe about this podcast. I'm super excited because each and every month, I'm just blessed and honored that more and more people are are listening to this, um, this little freak show I call blending the family the podcast so all right that's about it duke's laying down right now i need to edit this podcast and then get it out to you you as i like to say you have to remember in the mortal words of terry cruz your success is my success I think I was 30 seconds late. <laughs> awesome. No problem at all. Don't fire me. <laughs> You're not fired. Well, not yet. Everything is good. I was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, hold on. I teased almost. Du- I got to use a little boys room. Crud. Get hurt. <laughs> awesome. I'm here. I am ready. And I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go? Where are you going? I'm ready to go. Well, don't go anywhere. Hang out with me for an hour. <laughs> you got it. I'm all yours. All right. You you have to explain. I'm a little bit confused. Well, I'm a lot confused. First of all, I don't want to screw up Satya. You nailed it. Okay. 100%. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a very pretty name, but it's a very unique name. It is, sir. Thank you very much, Satya. Yes. W- what's the what's the um, behind the <laughs> scenes of it? Really, really. Okay. Yes, I was not born with the name Satya. That was not my given name. That's why so I was Satya. so confused because I was looking at some other 
information, I'm going, uh, huh? And I, and I'm guessing I'm, I'm going to, here's, here's the story I'm going to pretend is what happened. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> you, um, you had a really bad day and you're like, you know what? I'm done. I'm, I, I have to find, I have to find the meaning of life. Where do I go? I'm going to go to the Himalayas. And as you're traveling to the Himalayas, you like this so far? As yeah. you're traveling to the Himalayas, you met this Buddhist slash Yogi Kuda. And, <laughs> and, and it was like you became part of their tribe. <laughs> and they said, we have this magic hat. And it's within this magic hat, you are going to draw your new given name. And that's how it happened. I love it. I <laughs> wish that were the story. But you know what? My story is actually really super cool and somewhat aligned with what you just shared there. It kind of is. Really? Yeah. All right. It hold really on. kind of is. I All didn't right, need Buddhist. Here we go. Here we go. And... Satya, everybody Satya. gather around, gather around the, um, the campfire. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> yes. So being with the same man for 24 years. Congratulations. Thank you very much. He's now my ex-husband. Congratulations. Thank okay. Thank you very much. Right? So we were together seven years before we got married, 15 years before we had children, so funny because I just texted him a couple of days ago. He's back in Texas, which is where we met. He's running around with his brother, and he went to go see my parents and say hello. And I said, man, did we ever share a lot of life together. And obviously my name, Linda, prior, before, was my given birth name, totally imprinted, obviously, in me and on me. And then being with this man for 24 years, and that journey that now I've been apart for five, coming up on five years in June. And the journey from, as you well know, Tommy, that it's quite a journey of release, of awareness, of whatever it is you want to say. But for me, I really, really no longer resonated with my given name. I just didn't feel like that person anymore. And I, you know, I read a book like, 17 years ago called the mutant message down under. So here goes the tribe piece and all this stuff. It wasn't my vision quest, but it was this woman's vision quest with the Aboriginal people and the Aboriginal people, when they have any kind of personal transformation, growth, expansion, they change their name to reflect who they are now. It might not even be once that they change their name. So it's not, you know, it's a cultural thing. They change it to who they are and who they become. And so that, I tucked that in the back of my mind all those years ago. I thought that was so incredibly beautiful. And then going through the process of divorce and that incredible journey of contrast and ebb and flow and all of it, the evolution, the expansion, the grief, the mourning, um, I thought, you know what? I'm not Linda anymore, but I don't know who I am in, in a sense of a name, and I want that to come to me. So it really did. It came to me so beautifully. And it is from, it's Sanskrit. And it's one of the five yamas in yoga. It's satya. So it's behind nonviolence. And it means truthfulness in particular with your words. So, yeah, I allowed that to unfold. And it was such a beautiful journey. And it fits. It fits. It feels really, really good. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I'm, I'm quite honored that you did uh, let, let the listeners and myself understand. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is, I, I really wish, I don't know, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could change my first name because it, it does identify who I am because it's, it's the flip side with me, though is mm -hmm. I don't like to be called Tom. I don't like to be called Thomas. Oh. <laughs> and I had a speech teacher in college who refused, refused to call me Tommy. She goes, that's very immature. I go, well, that's who I am. <laughs> and that's how I 
like to be identified as Tommy because to me it it feels more inviting, relaxing. But that's an amazing journey for you is to really realize, all right, I'm no longer married to this man. It's time for me to find a new path. And you're you're almost like changing your your uh, whole identity, like uh, you you join the mob or, or, or getting away from the mob, and totally. now you have to, you know, <laughs> you have you go. to go get the uh, the minivan and all that stuff. So I I commend you on that. That's that's just that's a great story. Thank you. I appreciate you asking because it is a little confusing for people. They do see, you know, the Linda and the Satya, and is this person the same person? I've had the funniest funniest story with this. So I had a, um, a business colleague reach out, a new colleague in a group that I'm in, and he reached out to me and he said, do you have a twin sister? <laughs> and I was like, uh, no. And I just thought he was going to say that there's somebody out there that looks so much like you. And he was like, well, I was on this website, Turning Point Parenting, and her name is Linda, and she sounds like you, and she looks like you. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the best story by far and we just crack up laughing I'm like nope that's me that is totally me that was a pretty good story and you know too as well Tommy that I wrote my parents a letter and obviously they were the first people I told before I made any kind of legal changes or anything and I wrote them a letter explaining my whole journey with it and they you know to me were the most important I mean my children of course they were actually the most important. And my parents letting them know. <laughs> don't worry, that, don't worry. I'll edit true. I'll edit that out for you. No, leave it. It's totally <laughs> fine. I will speak again, I'm speaking my truth. Um, but my parents were totally fine with it. And my mother just like grasped onto it so quickly. It was really oh, so beautiful. She's embraced it and she understands. It was powerful. Yeah, but thank you so much for asking. Well, like I said, I was very confused, and I did hear, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say I'm like a music agent, but I discovered you or stumbled upon you because you were on one of my mentors' podcasts, Stephen, uh, Stephen James, uh, Peter, Stephen James Peterson, but I can say that once, and <laughs> I just found th- the problem I had uh, with listening to you and Steven was that you guys were using like those $30 words. And I'm just like, well, if I interview her, I hope she realizes I'm just a simple guy. I'm a simple guy named Tommy. That's how I roll. <laughs> You're funny. $30 words. What's an example? I, Give I, me an example. I, I can't remember. I remember okay. because, because you and Steven were on a very cerebral um, consciousness of, of talking and I'm just going, cause I know Steven and he, he, mm-hmm. he's a very well-educated person and I'm just going, Oh God, I, I, I don't know if I can compete with her on, on this podcast, but you know what? That's okay. Mm, see, that's the beauty. So I have to share that the, the beauty in that, the beauty in that vulnerability and the beauty and the authenticity and the beauty of you, right? Like, this is me. This is me. And that's what we're trying to do here, right? I mean, really. Because I just want to be me. I want to be me. I want to find myself and be me. And I love it. Profound. See? Already right there. Ooh. I always remember Zig Ziglar would always say, I'm going to give you a profound statement. How do you know it's a pro- profound statement? I'm telling you. It's a profound statement. So you just <laughs> right. you just did that. <laughs> Totally. I love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who's to say? (laughs) I love that. Fantastic. (laughs) And and this is why I, I love having conversations versus I've had other podcast guests uh, ask for me to send them preloaded questions and I said I don't do that I want to have a conversation I want you to just like like you said bring your authentic self bring your truth and you know 
I'm I tell people I spent time in college. I didn't spend quality time in college, but I like to have fun. And at the same time, though, you're one of those people. I mean, especially um, being a, a parenting coach and seeing the things that you're trying to help people with. And right before we jumped on, you had uh, IM me about how how excited you were. You just got off a, a, a coaching call, and I was like, I just did that too. And I was like feeling so pumped up because, as you well know, if you're working with somebody and they're grasping and they're have that open mind or even if they don't have an open mind they're but they're willing to listen to what you're saying I just sit back and go this is wonderful and I was explaining to this client that that's why I love the podcast because I love um because he was asking about social media and he says well why do you you why do you have to use social media and I said because I want to share my guest with the rest of the world and I told him, I said, a lot of my guests, l- like you, have a coaching business, uh, like others, are authors, are speakers, and it's it's about, in my opinion, serving others. And he just couldn't grasp that concept. And so when you in, uh, I am me about, you just got off a coaching call, you're excited, that just makes mm-hmm. my day, because... Mm-hmm. I firmly believe, and I've had several, several different parenting coaches on this podcast, but I love it because each one of you brings something different to the table, just like you bring something to your clients that they might not have uh, physically heard or emotionally heard. Mm -hmm. So again, when you and Steven were, were talking, I'm sitting back and I started learning stuff going, oh, yes, I get it now. Mm. Yes, exactly. We all, like you said, having other parent coaches on and we each uniquely bring something to our client. The way I see it, and I really have had this sort of concept and theory from the very, very beginning of my practice, my clients and I are selecting one another. It's not me choosing them. It's not them choosing me. It's us collectively in unity saying yes to discover what can be, what can unfold together and their gifts that they bring to me and my gifts that I bring to them. And it's the, that's the reason we are together. It is absolutely that way. I love it. And so you said, you know, you firmly believe that, you all all the different parent coaches they bring something to their clients and I believe that I so believe that you can work with I, I've worked with many coaches actually because I like to walk my talk too so I always have a coach so if somebody's if I'm hoping and, and desiring someone to sign on a parent coach someone like me I really want to walk my talk as well and I have a coach like a business coach or a life coach and the uniqueness right that that, that and I love this I love that we are all here to co-create. We are co-creating here together to expand, to be in relationship, to evolve, to learn, to trickle that down to our children and allow that ripple effect for them to have their journey, right? We're showing them and we're allowing them to unfold in front of us versus us wanting to create our children into being something that we think that they need to be. And that's such the beauty And the uniqueness that I feel to go back to partnering with someone, discovering someone and saying yes to each other to work together because it's such a beautiful, unique synergy and relationship to, to, to learn really to learn from one another. Um, granted, of course, they're, they're usually coming to someone like me because they have some kind of pain. They're feeling they're in pain. They're hurting. There's something that's happening and they're needing assistance, of course, right? That's the reason people reach out. Um, yeah, so I just believe that we are meant to be together. And I tell, and, you know, I know that, t- Tommy, I have mentioned this to you, but I also coach the coaches from the organization where I was trained. And that's exactly what I say to them, too. I'm like, 
we are we are meant to be together. We all have our own uniqueness that we bring, our own little thumbprint, you know? And and you pull in that person for a reason, for a total reason. It's a really beautiful relationship. Well, it's one of those things that really resonates as I'm listening to you speak is that I was working on uh, my weekly column and one of the things I, I had written in there was being a man of faith. And wow. that is something I it was probably the first time I ever put those words down because I, even though I went to Catholic school, I was never a person mm -hmm. of faith. Mm -hmm. And I started hearing more and more of people talking about having faith and the world of a coincidence. And I started to really think about there are no coincidences. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. listening to you talk about coaching the coaches and, you know, being together and meant to be together, it goes back to my my theory is there are no coincidences. Mm -hmm. You were you were put in that position, you were put in that uh, so-called room and those others that are in that space with you there's a reason why you're all there mm -hmm. and one something just uh, popped in my head is as I was going through uh, your website turning point parenting mm -hmm. and you're talking about you know working together has there been situations and and I hope this isn't a too much of a dumb question, but has there been situations where you are working with both, uh, both parents, but the parents aren't on the same page in their own little world? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how, how, yes. how do you work with them to get them not only on the same page, but on the same page with you? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go back because this is so awesome. First of all, it's so funny. I was raised Catholic as well. And um, I went to a Catholic school until fourth grade. And um, being a man of faith, and so being a woman of faith, mine is a different faith. And I just wrote my parents another letter. And I gave them gratitude and thanks for modeling to me their spirituality. My spirituality very much different, differs from their spirituality now, right? I mean, when I was raised, I was going to church and doing the things that I was supposed to do as the, the being in the youth in the home, but ventured off at 18 and started to do my own thing. And um, I, I just gracious, I sent them a letter right before I went to Mexico in March and I sent them this letter before I left and just was, I was like, you know, I just want to really just give you so much thanks and gratitude for, for modeling your faith. I, 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 and I can, I can see it. Like, it's almost like, it's like, like I can see it right now. Right. And so my spirituality, even though it's different, is so just so in me and it's so, yeah. So the world of coincidence, there are no coincidences. I so, so, so resonate with that. And then we are put together in that space together for a reason. And then you said, all right, so have there been situations where parents are not on the same page in their world and on the same page with me? So going, so really truthfully on the same page with me, when they're on the journey with me, everyone's eyes are open. And I ask that when we very first start working together, that we are creating safe space and we're holding this space <clears throat> for 10 plus weeks. It's a 10 week package. If they want to sign on for more, they can, but we set up safe space and what that really means. And I, and I really hold this for myself and for them is that we're, we're allowing ourselves to be open and we're allowing ourselves to be curious. You know, we come in and we have, Oh, perhaps we have, well, I've done it this way with my children and it hasn't worked or I'm, you know, I don't know what this woman's going to say. Um, yeah, it's probably just another theory. It may not work. I may need to just toss it out. Right. So I, I asked from the very, very, very beginning, because here we are, are in this moment right now. Like, Tommy, you and I are here right now, right now, right now, 
right now. So anything in the past that has brought you to this space is wonderful, but the power and the presence of now and being in the now moment, you may have unpacked a bunch of stuff from your childhood and how you were parented. It's wonderful. It's how you perceive the world. It's the lens with which you see through. It's how your brain is developed. But you're still, we are here in this now moment. So I ask them to kind of shed and release and surrender and let go of everything in order to be here in the now moment and be open and curious. So being on the same page with me, or it's, it's almost, it's not even a, doesn't even come up. Because we're, we are on a transformational journey together. Me being their guide and their advocate and their deep, deep, deep listener. And the listening component, oh my gosh, I could, the listening component is so intense. Most people are not deeply listened to, actively, compassionately listened to. We gloss over, we paraphrase, um, in, in one ear, out the other, taking our own perception of it, twisting it perhaps. And in this setting, these people are sometimes heard, like so deeply heard for the first time, maybe about their childhood story or about their parenting. So being on the same page, I guess to answer that is such a long-winded answer with me, it's almost that that doesn't even come up because we've set the stage and the framework where we're here together and we've set up the safe space and we've set up what it means to compassionately listen to one another. But do you and feel so, do you feel that, and I apologize for interrupting, but, no, please. but do you feel that it's partially because maybe they've um, tried other, not necessarily coaches per se, but other techniques and neither of them real or they both realized, hey, this isn't working. Let's reach out to Satya and see what she has to offer. You know, I guess there. I mean, of course, I know backstories about a lot of my clients. I can't exactly say what they've done or what they haven't done, but one of my sort of theories that I hold strong to is that you know when you when you're venturing to become a parent and you're pregnant and you're a couple and you're you're excited about this baby entering your space and your your energy and your home most parents read books right they pick up and they they want to decide how are we going to parent are we on the same page etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know i think books are fantastic to give you framework but you have to go deeper and i tell my clients all the time that you could read 50 parenting books and I, and I say this analogy, reading a parenting book, gleaning techniques and tools, and then they don't work, it's because we're not getting to the root problem. We're not getting, and again, this analogy, I don't really know if it's good. You can let me know if it's good or not. But I, I, if you have a like gaping stab wound in your body and you're covering it up with a Band-Aid, like a parenting book would be the Band-Aid, you've got this gaping stab wound, not gonna, it's not going to heal it. Like this, this, what we do is we get to the root of what's happening in your subconscious patterning. And, you know, it's the trick. It does, it does it. And then all of those tools, all of those books, you can choose which methodology, which techniques, which concepts you decide to use that stick with you, that fit your unique family dynamic. But not until you address that, that gaping stab wound will you really be able to do so? You're just going to toss it out as another concept. So perhaps people have come and said, oh, I've tried this or that, and it hasn't worked. Yes, for sure, right? Um, absolutely. And but, that could be that could be part of it. By sure. the way, thanks thanks for the visual. of. In, in college, I was a sports medicine major, but I can't dissect without throwing up. So that gaping wound <laughs> analogy, I don't think I'll be having dinner tonight. Thank you. You're funny. <laughs> and you bring you, and you bring up one of my favorite points is, and I think you and I are very kindred spirits on this. Is that I love, I love to read as well, and I wish I was a, as the kids would say, a more better reader. But <laughs> the one thing I, I totally agree with you is that 
people will read books and they'll just continue reading books and they'll, you know, decipher some kind of knowledge, but they never use that knowledge. They never share that knowledge or they never take what they've learned and actually created something or done something about it. It's, I, I just need to absorb it and that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And again, to me, it's putting the the cart before the horse in a, in a sense. I mean, not that these tools, you know, you get, you get some ideas. I'm going to give you an example. Here's an example. Okay. All right, put the rubber to the road here. So for me, for me, 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 my experience as a parent, I went in, I read a bunch of books when I was pregnant. I decided, okay, the baby book from Dr. Sears, Attachment Parenting, this is what I want to do. I've got this nailed. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start early. And my daughter turned three and a half, and then I had a one and a half year old, my daughter and my son, who are now 14 and 12. And my daughter turned three and a half, and she started to use her voice, found her voice. I got super triggered, and I didn't know what to do. I was like, this, so I would yell, or I would put her in a timeout. Oh my gosh, which just makes me cringe at thinking about it right now for me, for me. Those tactics were not working, and I did not feel good, didn't feel good at all. And so I was given a book, really just from a friend, kind of a situation where she was like, oh, hey, this this book, Raising Our Children, Raising Ourselves, I think it's a phenomenal read. It kind of remi- it reminds me of you, Linda, at the time. And I was just so curious, like, what does this woman think of me, right? And I read the book. Phenomenal book. Fantastic book. Says it in the title, Raising Our Children, Raising Ourselves. Raising Ourselves. So here's where I'm going to go with this example. In this book, the concepts were there about how to raise ourselves. And then I didn't know how to translate that material in the book to raising my children. So I knew, sort of like at a philosophical level, you don't want to give your baggage to your kids. You don't want it right. There was all these ideas and concepts in the book, but there were no tools. I didn't understand. So I couldn't bridge the gap. So I under, this was like, I was like, okay, so raising our children, raising ourselves. Okay, Naomi, Albert, thank you so much. This is what I want to do. This is the philosophy that I want to integrate. I don't want to give my baggage to my children. I want to be able to deal with my stuff as it comes up figure out how to be my own healer in the sense, right? So then I could be that emotional coach for my children and not spill and not have the multi-generational inheritance play out for them too. And so what happened though was there were no tools in that book. It was all concepts. And so again, I just didn't know what to do. And so really, and that's truthfully, then serendipitously, the Giant Institute for Parenting presented itself to me. And as I delved into that and said, yes, and I wanted to be a part of the program and become a parent coach, oh my gosh, it was this philosophy tied with all of the tools. And so it goes back to that, that kind of what you're saying again, they're not using the knowledge when they're reading the books, but it's also like there ha- it has to be hand in hand. It has to be that personal growth, that development, that understanding your triggers, what's happening, where do the triggers come from? How do I identify a trigger? Do I know how even how to do that? Even when I'm super triggered and when I'm in low mode of my brain, you know, fight, flight, or freeze, and everybody in the house is freaking out, well, what do we do, right? So, or when you're in the middle part of your brain or the upper part of your brain, you're still in logic and reasoning, how do I handle the vol- moving up the volcano, which I've given my children a visual of when they were super young, seven and five, and they still talk about it. It's so amazing. Moving up the volcano. I feel like I'm moving up the volcano. I'm going to erupt, right? And then I know, Ah. okay, this is what they need. It is a phenomenal visual, especially for young children. I I didn't know if we were doing some kind of uh, sacrifice. (laughs) It's tribal. Tribal, oh, there you go. Tribal, land, community, tribal, yogi thing. <laughs> we got going on here. 
<laughs> so when you were saying your daughter was finding her voice, was that meaning that she was talking back to mom? Exactly. And then how did how did you handle or or was that a necessity, I guess? Did your son go through that? at a period of time or was he just, I mean, cause he's a boy, so he's probably a little angel. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, nice. Nice. I'm glad you're, you're holding it for the masculine. <laughs> I love that. So of course my son went through it. Absolutely. And we want our children, we do want our children to roll through these developmental phases that where their brains are developing and three and a half, six and a half, six, six year change, nine year, 13, 15. These are all very, very crucial times for children to develop. And we want them to roll into those cycles. So yes, my son more definitely did it. And actually his was more intense because he was more physical. So he used his limbs to communicate quite often. Um, so I'm guessing karate type moves. Mm, yeah, hitting, hitting, kicking, for sure, for sure, right in the three and a half. My mother-in-law, she's passed, but my mother-in-law was a total freak zone. She couldn't handle it. And here I was, <clears throat> right, she was freaking out, so I'm trying to tend to her, and then I'm knowing that my son needs to go through this, but because he was taking it out on me, because I'm, he's securely attached to me, and then my mother-in-law, you know, she she's very, again, like I said, she's passed, but she's very vocal about her story and her journey in life. She was abused physically. And so it was such an incredible trigger for mm. her to watch that. So navigating her emotions and navigating what was happening for my son, that was fascinating too. Very so, fascinating. So what advice... Can you give to other uh, moms and dads who went, who might eventually go through it, or have maybe friends and family that might be going through it? How how did you handle that uh, physical and emotional display from your angel son? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the one thing I always like to say is that this too shall pass because it is a developmental phase that they are going through. And, you know, I have to say that <clears throat> I was, I'm going to go back, Tommy, and answer this, but I was picking peaches at a peach orchard, and there was a whole bunch of us. There was like 12 of us there. And we picked peaches, and we're all having a good old time. It was like a Sunday afternoon. My daughter was around three-ish. My son, again, was one-ish. And we're all standing in a circle, kind of just talking and saying goodbye and everything. And my daughter, for some reason, I don't know what was going on. Maybe it wasn't giving her enough attention. She started to communicate with her limbs. <clears throat> and just like my son did more often. And she it was pretty rare for her, but she started to do that. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I was utterly, totally socially embarrassed, right? So which was wonderful. I'm raising my hand right now, literally wonderful. Because that was an opportunity for me to look into that later, right? But so I was I was in the situation, there's all of us standing there, and she is coming up to me and she's hitting me and she's freaking out. And I'm this mom standing there with this other little baby on my back in an ergo and my little one hitting me. And I'm like, I'm so embarrassed. And this amazing woman, wise woman came over to me and she said the exact same thing that I'm saying now. She said, that's how they communicate. They don't have the language. They don't have the words to put to their big feelings. And so I just was like, oh, almost like a light switch. I just was at ease, and all I wanted to do was support my child. And so now, obviously, this was before my training. And so now, obviously, I have the training and the background and the knowledge to understand, oh, my gosh, yes. What I was going through is exactly what our children are intended. They're, they, they're supposed to go through this, right? So our parents, as parents, we, we do. We, we freak out. Oh, my gosh, they're hitting me. They're going to be like this forever. This too shall pass. And then what we do in those moments is really, really, really important. So it goes back to whether or not we're clearing our subconscious patterning or not. But 
your child, if they're hitting you and they're not communicating, they're in low mode. They're in fight, flight, or freeze. They can't hear words that you are going to say to them anyways in that moment. So we integrate what's called a sensory tool. You find what sensory tool works for your child and you integrate it. So a sensory tool meaning touch, do you need to hold them really, really tightly? Sometimes that, that actually doesn't work for children. Sometimes it does. Do you need so sensory like smell? Do you need to have an essential oil nearby, which actually worked for my son for quite some time? Um, do you need to maybe start singing? Auditory. And now listen to this one. This is so interesting. This one worked for myself, and it worked for my daughter, too. <laughs> Clapping or snapping in your ears. And it seems, yeah, it seems so counterintuitive. Like in the moment when everybody's freaking out to snap or clap, but it like, it brings your brain back. You're like, all of a sudden you're back, <laughs> and then you're rolling back into the middle part of your brain. <sighs> back into the feeling space, you know? So almost like you were like knocked offline, which is what Dr. Daniel Siegel refers it to. You're knocked offline, put back online. Oh, 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 okay. This is what's going on, right? And so snapping and clapping. So in those moments, words, 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 words do not work. So that's the guidance I would give parents. And truth be told, I'm talking a lot. You can just interject whenever you want, Tommy. Can I tell you, I am sitting here taking tons, tons of notes. And I, I'm just like, I feel like I'm one of your coaching clients now. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Uh, um, it's so cool. So when you're talking about, yeah, oops, sorry. When you're talking about the, the snapping and clapping, you really, <laughs> this, I mean, I don't think I've said this to anybody in a long time, but I played uh, ice hockey for like a little bit over 20 years as a as a goalie. So I've taken a lot of pucks to the head, so I apologize. I'm a little slow. And <laughs> something you just said just finally sunk in with me, and that is why if you ever go to a, a Tony Robbins event, and he does that, he does that that clapping because he's – trying to get everybody recentered. So mm -hmm. they'll do an exercise and then he gets everybody back into that zone. So uh, as I'm listening to you talk about either clapping or snapping, I'm like, Oh, I get it. I get it. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and then the other thing I was writing down is, okay, you have to explain. And, and I think not to generalize, but a lot of us have heard the, the fight or flight instinct, but you're adding freeze to it. So, mm -hmm. fight, flight, or freeze. Explain, mm -hmm. explain the the freeze aspect of this. Right. So imagine <laughs> you see a horror movie, fight. Right. That's one option. Flight. They take off. Freeze. You stand there. That'd be me. I'd freeze like an idiot. I'd be like, ah! <laughs> what a, I'm not going to fight, and I don't know. But, you know, who knows? Maybe I might flee. But it's just one of the components of the brain. Fight, flight, or freeze. It literally, it, it's that simple. It's just one of the options. So you freeze, right? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Um, my, brain, my brain's offline again. My brain's offline. And I, ah, I don't know what to do. It's simply, that's what it, that's it. That's all it is. Fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah. You need one more, and that's hide. That's me. Hide. Hide. I, I hide a lot. Perhaps avoid. Avoid. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... And my wife and I just... I, I shouldn't say it's but I'm going to say it anyway because it's my damn podcast. Uh, we got into this huge, <laughs> huge blowout. Um, and that's what she told me I do too much of, which she's, she's right. I do. I avoid, I, I hide. I, yeah. So here, this is fascinating. This is so fascinating. So another one of my passions way in college was I took a class called creating productive relationships. Ooh. And this class was all about style profile, behavior profiling. And I fell in love with it. And I talked to the professor and I said, where, who uses this? I want to work for the companies that use this. I want to teach this, la, 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 la. 
Well, I became an entrepreneur and so I just did it myself. So I've integrated this into my work as well. So I have my client take that became an affiliate with the company that does the style profiling test. And it doesn't surprise me at all, Tommy. And if you were my client, I would say, oh my goodness, give yourself some grace and some compassion and some love that what you do is when you hit your backup behavior, right? You're like, you're stressed. You're like, boom, you're going up. Just picture a graph and you're going up the graph. Oh my gosh. Or a volcano, whatever you want to do, whichever one works better. You hit that stress point. You revert. They call it, you revert back to your home based behavior. And for an analytical, you avoid. It's so simple. You avoid. So an expressive, someone who's social, butterfly, right? The one, oh, I'm out there, I'm doing my thing, it's all about people and blah, blah, blah. When they hit their back at behavior, they attack with words. When an amiable hits their back at behavior, they go along, they acquiesce. And when a driver hits their backup behavior, they control more. They become more controlling. My way or the highway. So I've integrated this into my, into my work because I want my clients to understand where their natural tendencies are, but also I want them to understand that they have versatility and they can increase that. So imagine that volcano just getting bigger or imagine that graph. And there's so many things that you can do before you hit that backup behavior to allow that to stretch longer and longer and longer and longer, right? So you can be more versatile and work with those other behaviors. So, so give yourself some love and some grace because avoidance makes total sense. You're definitely an analytical. Well, my wife so called like, my, another phrase, my wife says you're shutting down and I do, I'll just mm-hmm, shut down. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Not, not to get super analyzed, but uh, I like it. I'm used to it, but <laughs> it was a really difficult situation when uh, my wife and I first moved in together because, you know, for, I'm trying to think, how long was I, I think I was divorced for, at that time, four years. So it was pretty much every other weekend, it was just my son and I, and, less, and, and you know, I was traveling at that time for work. So I spent spend a lot of time alone when my wife and I moved in together she has uh, two daughters and then our first summer together it was the two girls and then my wife's niece moved in with us and at that time we had um, we're down to one dog but we had two dogs and even one of the other dogs was a female Mm. I had a little too much estrogen mm-hmm. in this house. And not not mm-hmm. and not to say that was the cause, but it, part of it was... Are you snapping your finger at me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing is, because I'm very much an introvert and I am an, you know, an only child, when all these ladies would be in the same room together or the uh, the flip side is when my two bonus daughters would get into, you know, their sisters and they mm-hmm. get into their arguments. Again, I would shut down. I didn't know what to do. I don't know how to handle that kind of conflict. I'm, I'm exactly. even though I'm a so-called parent, I'm like, uh, I, I, I gotta go. I gotta go hide. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly. what I would do. I mean, there there were several times where, at the time, uh, right now the home office is upstairs, but back then the home office was downstairs, and I would grab a a wine glass and go, "I'll be in the office." <laughs> I'm out of here. Peace out, dog. Out. I'm out. Yes. Yeah. It makes total sense. Great. Being analyzed again. That's okay. I'll, I'll just send, send me a bill. <laughs> so I want to ask one of my favorite uh, questions on this podcast. And I think this is going to be a unique um, perspective coming from you. Um, are you... Uh, 
I, I'm just going to have to come out and say. It. So here, let me do. Let me reverse it. Let me ask okay. the question and get your perspective. Okay. So the the question I'm I always ask on this this podcast to the guest is when my wife and I were dating, we took um, a covenant. Sorry, I, I was watching one of my favorite movies, Yes Man. Uh, recently, and that's that was the, that was the word they used, and I just love that movie. It's one of my favorite favorite. It's going to sound odd, but it's going to it's one of my favorite motivational movies. It's just mm-hmm. a great movie. Mm-hmm. Um, Good movie. Jim Good Carrey is just I, I just love him to death. But my wife and I said that, and we first dated, and then we decided, all right, we're going to. Um, get our kids together. Like I said, she has two daughters. I have a son. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started thinking going, and you we were talking earlier about books. I'm going in my, I hadn't seen any type of book available to really help with the situation of, all right, what do you do when you want to have your, your girlfriend's kids and your kids and get them to meet and so we pretty much winged it okay and i said well let's let's find a neutral location because if the kids Mm -hmm. just don't want to hang out with each other no pressure so my wife were dating then we decided all right let's get the kids together and see if this is going to work and what we said was if the kids don't get along we weren't going to continue the relationship what are your thoughts on that? Wow. Yes. So if the kids, let me just make sure I'm hearing you correctly. If the kids don't get along, we will not continue our relationship. Correct. Because the, the our thinking was we didn't want to add additional baggage. Absolutely. Right. Um, I mm-hmm. mean, even though, even though, um, like my son, we only had him every other weekend, but still he's, you know, not to say he's, well, he's not part of the family. He's part of the family, but I still felt that I wanted to create, you know, even though happiness is a, can be a fleeting moment type thing, I still want to create a successful, happy family. But again, if the kids didn't get along, what are you creating? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, so as you know, as I'm, as you framed the the question and the scenario, you know, there were no books available for us. So we were just kind of winging it. So then basically we said, let's find a neutral location. And then we kind of both agreed conceptually, if the kids don't get along, we won't continue the relationship. And it's, so literally the, the framework of it seems like, okay, if they don't get along in this one meeting... We're not gonna like we're not gonna we're not gonna continue it. So I'm imagining that's not the case. If it was just the one meeting and it bombed, then you guys were gonna bail on your relationship, right? You know, I I can't answer <laughs> that. And and here's and here's why. Because it didn't bomb. And that's you know, you <laughs> I've never thought of it that way. Because as as I've told numerous times the story was so uh satya the the neutral location was an outdoor ice skating rink Mm -hmm. and my son and i uh got there early and he and i were standing in the middle of this little ice rink and my wife's youngest daughter who's um well now she's 16 my son connor's 15 so they're just about a year apart so they're Mm -hmm. very close in age and my wife's older daughter who's now 21 um but so my son connor and i are standing there and then my wife's youngest becca she comes up to my son connor slaps him in the shoulder and says tag you're it those two took off Mm, cute and and you know, wow, I'm speechless because I don't know what the next step would have been other mm-hmm. than 
would there, and that's a good point, would there have been a second so-called date with the kids mm-hmm. or or were we ready to just say, eh, one and done? Mm-hmm. I would imagine that it wouldn't have been one and done if you all were in love, you were ready to introduce the children. That's a big, big, big step. But again, it's one of those things. It's like, how can we, how can we foresee or how can we project what it would have been, right? So it's a hard, it's a hard one to answer. I mean, in the sense of, oh, again, being there for our children, see that the biggest piece is allowing for empathy and allowing for our children to be heard. So for them, and I went, and I said it earlier about having our basic needs being met. And there's a lot of basic needs, but being heard, understood, appreciated, loved, respected, right? So when we are doing this co-creative dance together, and if our children are being met with their needs, being met with empathy, real empathy, not false empathy, real empathy, I feel that relationships can be seen from both sides and all perspectives. Our children are so incredibly intuitive. They're so incredibly, they read energy. They, that's how they, when they're babies, they don't speak yet. They're reading energy. That's how they communicate. They read energy. And so they're so dialed in and we don't really give our children enough credit so again, like that framework is it's a it's it's actually a little tricky to to respond in a very pat answer because who would have known? I mean, who would have known that Becca would have hit Connor on the shoulder and said, "Hey, tag, you're it, right?" Yeah. And who would you have bailed? Who knows? Yeah. Right. But again, giving our kids the space to be heard, for their feelings to be acknowledged, for them to be able to have the space to share what they are feeling, and especially around a topic so incredibly important as this, is blending a family. That's the key. That's the key. Real empathy and deep, deep listening. So have you had this conversation with yourself as far as... When and if? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's... I... You know... Again, I've been almost coming up on five years. I've been apart and single for the whole time. And there is someone in my life right now on the, on just right now, just very cursory. And I have not introduced my children to anyone over the years that I've just, you know, dated here and there. And this particular gentleman, um, my children, we, my kids and I were going to go do a 5K. And he decided he wanted to come see us and, and um, be at the starting line, right? And so I let my children know that he would be there and this would be an opportunity to potentially meet him. Like if we see him, because the run was pretty big and crowded. And um, we didn't see him at the starting line, but we saw him at the end. And it was fascinating. And he knows the story, but it was fascinating. My daughter, I go, oh, there he is. Let's go say hi. And we were walking over there. My daughter continued to walk, continued to walk, right? And then my son was there with me and we introduced and they had a little conversation and we, and we walked off and I ended up having a really powerful conversation with my daughter about what was going on with her. I was like, wow, you know, I noticed this and how are you feeling? But we, so, so Tommy, we have the baseline. My, my children and I have this baseline of the trust and the mutual respect and they know that I listen to them, I validate them word for word. They know that they know that they're heard. And so as she was sharing with me what was she was feeling in the moment, she felt safe to do so. So again, there's yet another caveat, right? If there's the set of circumstances that are like this for someone else and they don't have that basis of mutual respect and trust and that parent is triggered by that child walking away, thinking that it might be disrespectful and rude, that's a whole different, whole different situation. But for me, I thought, okay, I'm going to go in and find out what was going on for her. And she shared. So I'm going to play the what if game with you. And let's say your daughter says, you know, mommy, I I don't want you to date that person anymore. 
Yeah. Okay. So I can play. I'll play the. I'll play. Okay. But my daughter, my daughter would never say that. <laughs> she wouldn't again because we have this this other relationship. So she knows. She anyway. But if a child were to say that, then I would guide a parent. I would I would validate her. I would say, I hear you. You do not want me to date him. And then I would pause. And say nothing else. And 99% of the time, they share more. And then we go around in a circle. And then here's the thing. This is what comes out. Something that's happening within them. And not about mommy dating someone. And I'm going to, can I give you an example? Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay. So this is awesome. My daughter was younger and it's not about dating. But... It's still a similar vein as what I'm saying that you could use in those moments. So my daughter was in first grade, so she was seven, and she's observant. She's more of an introvert. And they had to get up in front of the class, and they had to start the little verse or whatever, right? And so each child would have to get up, and it was alphabetical order. So it's Benaventi, right? So she's super early in this whole get up in front of the class and start the verse. She didn't have to say the verse on her own. She just had to start it, get up in front of the class and start it. And then she could sit back down. So she comes home from school that particular day and she says, well, mom, and she, we were sharing a bedroom at the time. They were so young and she was upstairs and we were about to go to bed. And she said, mom, so I don't want to go to school on Thursday. And this was like a Tuesday or something. I don't want to go to school on Thursday. And I was like, okay. And I was in bed. So I got out of the bed and I went on the floor and I sat next to her. And she goes, I go, you don't want to go to school on Thursday. No, I don't want to go to school on Thursday. Okay. And she said, because I have to get up and I have to start the verse. I said, okay, you have to get up and start the verse. I literally repeated her words back to her word for word. And she said, and I'd go, oh, okay, you don't want to get up and do the verse. Yeah, I don't want to get up and do the verse. I'm, I'm shy. I don't want to get up in front of the class. I just repeated her, repeated her, repeated her. At the very, very end, we came full circle. Again, because children have their own solutions. We don't have to force feed them with anything. We don't have to say, oh, but honey, you're smart. And you, oh, but honey, right? She ended up coming to the fact all full circle. And she said, well, Lily is shy like me. Lily is shy like me. And Lily did it. So I could probably do it. So, I mean, it was... Her fear, she didn't need anything from me. She just needed me to be there to hold space for her. And she was hurt through the whole thing. So to go back to the dating analogy, if my daughter were to say that, and I would say, oh, I hear you, right? And I would just allow her to speak. I would hear probably some fears or limiting storylines or some beliefs or something that she would need to get out. And then we'd move through that. And she'd unpack it, and she would feel heard. And, and again, more than likely, it's not about me dating someone. It's about her fear, which is what my daughter said. She actually said she was scared. Scared of? Scared, perhaps, of mommy going away or losing mom. Uh, right? Oh, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's all about our feelings being heard. And validated. And I just, I mean, I can't tell you day after day, I'm on, I'm on client calls every day. I'm working with grown adults who are parents who, when they go back to their childhood, A, they weren't accepted for who they were. They were shamed. Oh, I couldn't feel my feelings. I would actually, I would have to be told to go to my room because I couldn't feel my feelings. That's all we want to do is be authentic and feel our feelings and share our feelings. Well, it goes back to we want to be heard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I was just and how thinking. are we heard? We are heard through validation from that parent. From that parent. That's how we are heard. That's us as parents stepping into the emotional coach role, figuring out our own baggage to be able to do so, and stepping into that role and allowing our kids to be heard. 
it seems so simple, yet it's so not because we're so triggered. But that's it. Well, one of the things I, as I was listening to your story about uh, your your kids meeting your your friend, as as the kids would say, this is my friend. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember one time uh, my mom was getting ready to go out on a date with this guy, really nice guy, but it was just like, really, this guy. <laughs> and then there was uh, my mom was dating this. Uh, one gentleman who is a very high ranking military guy and he came to the the house threw his dress shoes at me literally threw his dress shoes at me then threw the uh, shoe polish at me and said go clean my shoes I'm like oh dear god please don't this I can't have this guy being my next dad even thank goodness that didn't work out and um, the guy that my mom ended up marrying my bonus dad. He, one of the greatest men I've ever met, other than my dad. So I'm just very blessed that uh, I've got a couple of happy dads in my life. And you had some good modeling, and it's also about your mother making those choices, right? Trusting in herself and listening to her intuition. And so trusting in ourselves and listening to our intuition is is us doing our work. Mm. Is us doing that work. I haven't introduced anyone to my children. There hasn't been anyone that I've wanted to introduce to my children. Well, you know, for me, my concern, because I, I only dated one other person for a short period of time before um, I met my wife, and there, some of the concerns were, number one, I didn't want this person to uh, suck up my time with my son. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing, too, is, and I've, I've seen this with my friends, is that the kids will get attached. And if mm-hmm. you end up breaking up, mm-hmm. not only are you breaking up, the kids are breaking up with, with that person. So that's, that's rough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen that too. Mm-hmm. It's painful. Mm-hmm. So I definitely want to respect your time, but I want to get this mentioned. If you can really talk about uh, the, is it the Jai Institute? Am I saying that correctly? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, the Jai Institute for Parenting is where I was certified. So I was certified to become a parent coach. Started my training in 2011. And then I finished in 2012, and then the founder of the organization, who is my colleague and dear, dear friend, Jolette Jai, that's where the Jai comes from, Ah. Jai Institute for Parenting, Mm -hmm. she uh, pulled me in to coach the coaches about four and a half, five years ago now. And um, yeah, so it's a virtual program. So if anyone's interested in becoming a parent coach to do what I do, highly recommend the Jai Institute for Parenting. Most definitely. What was special about going through that training? Well, it kind of goes back to what I was mentioning before about the raising our children, raising ourselves, and that's the philosophy of, you know, not passing along your baggage to your children and being their emotional coach, but not having the tools to do so. That book just didn't give me the tools. This program, we look at you first, so we unpack, we unpack it all, (laughs) And then you get so many tools and you learn. Then, So the, the program is a 24-week program. In the first 10 weeks, you go through it as a client, just like your clients would go through the material. Mm-hmm. The second 10 weeks, you learn how to coach it. And then the last four weeks, you learn uh, business, marketing, sales, tactics. So it's a 24-week approach to becoming a parent coach. And um, very, very, very effective. And I had been an entrepreneur before. And so when I was finished with my training and off and running, I was ready. I was so ready. And that's where I, you know, created Turning Point Parenting and became the founder of my business. So, yeah, but the Jai Institute for Parenting is, it's really, to me, it encompasses all of those books that you read and all those tools that you glean, plus taking a look at the, uh, the gabbing, the, 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 the 
gaping stab wound. <laughs> Thank you. And kind of <laughs> suturing that up, if you will. You apparently what I'm hearing you say is you like guts and gory. <laughs> you like horror movies because a lot of your examples have no. been dealing with that. So I know it's so funny because I don't. Ever since <laughs> I became pregnant and became a mom, I'm like, oh no 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 no, can't watch that stuff. <laughs> no. Yeah, it just uh. makes me think of yeah when fight flight or freeze. I avoid those things now. I try and stay in my middle upper part of my brain, please and thank you. I'm no psychiatrist, but I think there's something hidden somewhere in in, <laughs> in that uh, head of yours, Satya. <laughs> <laughs> what does that may, mean? I, Do tell. Share I'm, more. I'm just saying because you you say you don't like the horror and, and all that, but you like to use them as examples. So, um, not not to put any warning out there for potential suitors, <laughs> but keep the knives away from her? I don't know. Potential suitors. That's pretty funny. That's funny. So what's next for you other than um, picking up your your kids, including that angel of yours, that son of yours, who hopefully is feeling 100% better? Um, Sweet boy. (laughs) (laughs) So what is next? I'm, I'm working on some really cool cool, cool, cool things right now in the process of um, creating some online courses for parents to just take a little taste if they don't want to delve all the way right in. And I'm doing a little bit of market research right now and finding out from past clients what's happening in their parenting right now. And I've just been so incredibly pleased to hear as I'm calling my past clients and kind of revisiting them what's been going on and what, what they need. And so I'm putting that out in, um, in the online course format so parents can really, really just feel like, hey, you know, I just want to help. I help, want some help here or I want some help here. I want some help in the trigger piece or I want some help in setting some loving boundaries, right? They can just click and choose a course and do it that way. Um, I Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's actually, there's a lot happening right now. I'm creating, I'm in the, process of creating like a hub for parents to go to where it's like more of a um, sort of like a like a membership type of a place to go where you can have there's interviews in there with subject matter experts around say the field of early childhood development right I have an author of, of a, a book who we've done an interview so there's there's these little hubs where they can get you nutrition consulting um, digital digital online technology, right? What's happening with their sexuality. So there's all this, I'm creating this hub, like a membership site where parents can go and just, this is what topic I'm interested in. And I want to learn more about this. And then we'll have like a um, online a group that we're in together where you can continually ask questions. And a lot of my graduating clients, they roll right into a private group where I'm there and we can, they can still be interfaced with me as well. And so that, yeah, there's just a lot a lot of stuff that, that's happening right now and that's in the works. But other than that, I mean, I do, of course, still, obviously, my passion is my one-on-one coaching and my group coaching. So that's just what I won't ever not do, to be honest. Double negative, but I won't. That's just what I love, love to do, is to serve, serve people and help them with their families. Well, I'm sure you're excited for that one day when cloning can really happen because that way not only could you be working with your clients one-on-one you could be picking up your kids at the same time or going hitting a a disco i don't know what the kids do these days um yeah that was humor the kids the kids these days hit the disco yeah (laughs) yeah yeah my my kids always laugh when i say stuff like that and like Nobody says that. Like, Nobody says hit the disco. Yeah. Well, so you, somebody yes. does. Somebody does. Well, the beauty, and this is going to be another little shout out for the Jai Institute, I've created and crafted my life around my children's schedule, right? Because you're an entrepreneur, you can you can do that. And I can help families, and then I can help my family, too. I can be there. So that's why I can be picking my, my children up on a Wednesday afternoon at 1 o'clock 
And then I have a client call this afternoon at 4.30. So, right, we can create the life that we so desire and truly, truly, truly believe that. Well, Santia, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for uh, not using the $30 words around me because I was ner- nervous. I was scared. See, I can't even say the word nervous. I was so scared to say You're the word funny. nervous. You're funny. We used a bunch of $30 words, which I still need you to give me an example. Well, if you go back and listen to your episode with Steven, um, you'll, because I, you know, I just, you know, shut down. When I hear big words, I'm like. I hear big uh, words and shut down. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's too much thinking for me. I'm a simple man. Oh, that's awesomeness. Hey, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. It was easy. There was lots of natural flow to it. Um, I mean, I just feel like we could talk and talk and talk and talk and continue because this is good stuff. Well, we can. You have to pick up your kids. Uh, t- yeah, today. Yeah. Yeah. We chose We chose the early release day is what we did. This was the early release day. They're usually out at 3.15. But that's okay. That's okay. You get to spend more quality time with them. Yes, we'll play some gin rummy. That's what my son and I have been doing these days. <laughs> like old people. Yeah. 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 Gin rummy. It's pretty fun. Yeah. My my dad taught my son how to play poker one time. I, I was cracking up. I love it. Yeah. Texas Hold'em? Um, no, just regular five card. So, five yeah. card, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm like, it's a good skill to have. Yes, it is. Yeah. Super fun. Put on that poker face. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lady Gaga. (laughs) I love it. Thank you for listening to Blending the Family. Don't worry. We know he's not funny. That's Tommy. This episode is sponsored today by the book... 10 Tips on How to Survive Your Parents' Divorce. This book was written by kids. It's for kids. It's a coloring book. When you have a tragedy of divorce and you have young children who do not know how to express themselves, this coloring book, 10 Tips on How to Survive Your Parents' Divorce, is the coloring book for them. Pick it up today at blendingthefamily.com or even on Amazon. 10 Tips on How to Survive Your Parents' Divorce, again, written by kids for kids.